of the 10 gadflies are jerks and losers, and you never want to have anything to do with them. But one of those gadflies is going to revolutionize medicine or biotechnology or, or something or other. One of them is going to amount to something. I used to be one of those guys myself, the most obnoxious person in the room. And damn it, I still am. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, in China, so take, the, take the Soviet Union. Why did the Soviet Union fall? In many reasons. But here's, here's just a working theory. The Soviet Union was excellent at figuring out who the top 1% were intellectually. It had the best chess players. It had fantastic physicists. It had rocket scientists who could, who could lock rockets into space before the Americans could. It could do all these things very well, great ballerinas. But it didn't quite know what to do with the other 99%. And so if you were just in the 90th percentile in the Soviet Union, you were kind of screwed, to say nothing of the 50th uh, uh, percentile. Now, America, and I'll say Canada as well, I'm just assuming kind of the same, uh, little do I have. Um, we are cultures which actually make a point of finding ways to capture human talent and excellence at the 70, 60, 50, even 40, 40th percentile. And so we're making more of human capital, and we're finding wider and broader sources of human regeneration, including, by the way, through immigration. Because Salim wasn't born here. I was raised in Mexico City. My, my, my father was born in Mexico. My grandfather was born in Kishinev. Um, uh, China doesn't have this. Other cultures don't have this. And so at some point, the West will get its head out of its proverbial backside. The danger is that it's, that's going to take 10 years or 100 years as opposed to two years or five years. Tom? I have a quick comment and then a question. I think what you were saying, Mr. Stevens, about the collective guilt the left feel, self-loathing, that sort of thing, I think it actually in Canada at least applies across the political spectrum. We see conservatives, for example, and I find it quite nauseating, even conservatives who work in the energy industry, say how we're guilty for causing dangerous climate change and you know we have to pay the price. And so I really think it's a much broader problem than just simply liberals. My question is for Professor Mansour. Many people here probably don't know very much about the Caliphate. So I was hoping you could tell us how it worked to help unify the uh, Islamic culture generally worldwide, and whether or whether not, it would be a good idea to bring it back. Again, it's a very large, large uh, question, but very quickly, uh, the Caliphate, by the time it was abolished, was already a dead corpse. Uh, I hope I got the pronunciation right. Or it's very good Bob. In 1924, the Caliphate was officially abolished, and, and the caliph was sent into exile by Mustafa Kamal. The following year, in 1925, a mufti of Al-Azhar, one of the great, one of the scholars of Al-Azhar, and Al-Azhar is the premium institution of Sunni Islam in terms of education, uh, established in the 10th century. Um, a mufti of Al-Azhar wrote a book called um, Islam and the Fundamentals of Authority. And in that book, this mufti, his name was Sheikh Ali Abdul Razak, pointed out that is, there is nothing in Islam that is in the Quran, the two main sources uh, uh, in Islam of authority, that is the Quran, and the hadith, the Quran is a, my Muslims taken as the word of God, and the hadith is a revelation to the prophet, and the hadith is the life and tradition of the prophet that was recorded years after the prophet had passed away and put together. And so those are the two main canonical texts of Islam. And so the Sheikh argued that there's nothing, either in the Quran or in the hadith, to validate the Khalifa, the Khalifa. That this was an institution that was innovated by the companions of the Prophet under the exigency of the circumstances, and that then it came into a life of its own. I look back at it, Islam as it originated and spread, borrowed, 
borrowed immensely from all around, and eventually the caliphs were oriental despots. They had taken up the role of the Byzantine emperor and the Persian emperors. But as an institution, in political philosophy, we talk about institution, legitimate authority. This had the sanction of the companion of the prophet. And even though it became hollowed out very quickly by military rulers, the idea that the rule in Islam is only legitimate if it is based upon the Khalifa became part of Islamic history. But eventually, you know, it was basically overrun. It was dead. It was a shell of a thing. But putting it away was the last act. It was buried, and this shape provided the argument. But what happened to the Shaykh? He was immediately expelled from Al-Azhar. Luckily, he was not beheaded because Egypt was under the arrangement of the colonial rule, the British rule. That argument has resurfaced back again. As I said, the modern world cannot be uninvented, nor the 7th century can be recreated. The world of Islam, that is the Muslim world, is caught up in this hundred years battle of where and how legitimate authority will come about. And as I said a little while ago, in India, the legitimate authority is the democratic government, the representation, the will. Some of the great scholars of Islam in this hundred years have argued that. The one that is most notable was Muhammad Iqbal, who is revered as a poet philosopher of Pakistan, but who was an Indian who died a decade before Pakistan was created, and he wrote about that the modern institution, the parliament, would be the basis of a legitimate authority. But for all sorts of reasons, the states that were created in the, wo in the world after 1914-18, and more precisely after 1945, are now totally failed states. This is what Abdul Rahman Wahid was talking about. This is what People sitting outside the Muslim world, in some small way, I, we are struggling with. But inside the Muslim world now, because of the war, and I said, WBH, you know, when things fall apart, when center do not hold, anarchy is left loose, it's a grab for power. And the reference back to the Quran, the reference back to the Khalifa, whoever grabbing power is therefore legitimate. And then Musab al-Zarqawi had not been killed in that phenomenal military operation outside of Baghdad, whatever year it was, 2006. Then he would be now declaring himself the Khalif instead of the guy who spent some time in American prison and has now declared himself uh, Abu Bakr or Umar al-Baghdadi, whatever his name is, you know. So this is, this is opportunism right. Normans arriving on the shores of England and establishing the Norman Saxon, whatever it was, Henry II, you know. It's a grab for power. And this struggle will go on till it stabilizes, and it will stabilize. Because the vast majority of people want to be enjoying, accepting the benefits of the modern world. And these people cannot offer it. Isis, by the way, this is a Fundamentally, Isis might be smacked to smithereens, but Isis is the second iteration in the Muslim world. The first iteration of Isis is ruling the Muslim world, of ruling Arabia, hands and gloves, first with the British and then with the Americans. FDR traveled in his last journey from Yalta to meet with the supreme commander of the Isis of that time. His name was King Abdul Aziz ibn Saud. People don't remember history. And so if Easter stabilizes itself without being smashed to smithereens, then, you know, Obama and whoever will be then sitting with Omar al-Baghdadi. Well, that's the nature of politics. Whether, they, whether it will be Islamic or not, well, you know, some people will declare it Islamic, and a lot of Muslims will say, no, it is not Islamic. And they will be called, you know, heretics, and they will be chased after. <clears throat> okay, look, we're, we're running out of time, so we've got... <clears throat> Three people, if you could quickly ask, or four people, quickly ask your question all together and we'll have the panel have one last go at it. Robert? Okay, right. This is uh, sort of taking up what Brett, uh, Brett Stevens uh, especially said. Uh, how is uh, the world going to cope when the state is kind of removed from the chessboard, if you like? Uh, because uh, a lot of uh, American ex-allies are watching and uh, uh, 
quietly drawing their own conclusions all around the world. And uh, people like Putin are watching and seeing if the states can't, if the states is opening its southern border and inviting invasion. Uh, what position is it to deal with ISIS? This is uh, or the Ukraine's border again. So, uh, Okay. Uh, yeah, okay. And uh, finally, the Norman invasion by Henry II is Ireland, not England. Okay. Next question. Well, I was hoping the panel could address the, the idea of, of actual scripture. How much is, is actual scripture motivating this violence? And it doesn't seem to me that, that all these people that are members of ISIS are psychopaths, and they're not, you know, all making radically uh, incorrect interpretations of the Quran. They seem to be getting their motivation from their interpretation, of legitimate interpretation of scripture. So how do we deal with that when, you know, in scripture you have, ex it seems to me, exhortations of violence and beheadings and how, how are we gonna cope okay. with that? And last two questions, quickly. I think that I couldn't help feeling that we were going round and round in circles without actually providing any answer. But I think the answers come actually from some of the words that we're throwing here today. Quarantine the Islamic world. How do we do that? We do that by cutting off our importation of oil from the Middle East. At whatever cost, we must cut it off. We must develop our own resources. Question. The question, the question is, do you think this would be the solution to quarantine the Islamic world? Okay, and the last question, please. Uh, you spoke a lot about the history of the Caliphate and the Islamic history in this world, and so I was wondering, how is the absence of Caliphate um, causing acts like 9-11 and present-day acts? I, Although I understand the historic meaning of it, I really can't believe that if we had a contact today, would that prevent this from happening? And the same question is to you, Mr. Stevens. You spoke about the Age of Enlightenment and about our philosophies and our background and Locke and Rousseau and, and Voltaire and I, I don't know whoever else you, Hobbes and whoever you mentioned, but would it really? make a difference if our liberalism right now was